I want to start with coffee. Actually, I want to start with sleep. That's the first habit, sleep. You need to make sure that your sleep is tight. You know, you, you're sleeping properly. Some people need eight hours, some people need seven hours. I think it's a myth when people say, oh, I only need six hours. That's a lie. Your body is a machine. You have something in your body called circadian rhythm. And whether you like it or not, whether you believe in astrology or not, whatever that is, the circadian rhythm is true. Have you, have you noticed that some points of the day you feel lagged and some points of the day you feel alert? So for me, I, I'm a, they call it an owl. I, I can be very productive in the morning and I can be very productive at night, but in the middle of the day, oh, that's why I do my uh, jujitsu and all my stuff at midday. No, I don't have lunch, which is like, that's something I gotta fix your eating habits anyway. The reason why I have these two things is number one, you don't wanna have coffee when the sun is coming down. Okay, if you have a coffee machine at home, I have a coffee machine at home, I'm a coffee aficionado. You don't wanna have coffee when the sun is coming down. People go like, oh, it doesn't have any effect on me. No, it's because you're addicted already. Oh! And caffeine has some, has some chemicals on it that will keep you alert. Even if you're falling asleep, you're not really sleeping because it's taking too long for you to get into your deep state of sleeping, the, the rapid eye movement. And because of that, you might only have one cycle instead of two. We need two rapid eye movement cycles over the night in order to rest. Did you know that? And that cycle only lasts between 40 minutes to an hour. So when you say, oh, you know, I sleep seven hours, you don't sleep for seven hours. You take three hours to get into your deep sleep and then you deep sleep for 40 minutes and then you sort of wake up and you, you might not even remember and then it takes another three hours and then you sleep deeply again and then you wake up. No one has three cycles of deep sleep overnight, but number one, no caffeine when the sun is coming down. All right, habit number two, sun. When you wake up, I think in our societies, at least the Western societies, the vast majority of people wake up and the first thing they do, what do you think it is? They pick up their phones. And again, the same problem for the night, blue light, you wake up with the wrong light because the blue light will actually damage your eyes. But the sunlight will actually activate your circadian rhythm. Did you know that? When you, when literally, uh, scientists, as they say, if you wake up, you find the next, the next window in your room and just look outside for five minutes. And if you can, look straight into the sun. Obviously, if it's too bright, and you, you don't, but six o'clock in the morning, the sun is not too bright, you can do it. Once it's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, if you wake up that late, you're already wrong. So anyway, we can talk about that later, but um, you don't want to look at the sun at 10 o'clock in the morning because that's going to damage your eyes. That's a lot of um, ultraviolet rays and all of that. But six o'clock in the morning, you look to the sun, that will literally push the button in your alarm, literally. And that's why if you do that for 10, 15, 20 days in a row, you will never need an alarm again because you will fix your circadian rhythm and you will go to sleep at the, pro at the proper time and then you'll wake up at the proper time. Number three, exercise. I'm not an exercise coach. I'm not a fitness guy. I, I do practice some sports. I love the idea of sports. I grew up playing basketball. And um, I've, been, I've been watching this other guy called Brad Lee. I don't know if you've uh, seen Brad Lee on the internet, but he's like, He's been saying, look, I don't feel any happier if I'm shredded. With all due respect, Brad Lee, if you ever watched this video, that's bull crap. You're just trying to sell something because the reality is you feel better. When your body is healthy, you feel better. Now I'm not talking about uh, physioculturists and I'm not talking about that, you know, muscle up guys and all of that. That's their sport, that's fine. But as a parent, I wanna be able to lift weights because I wanna pick up my kids when they need it. I want to be able to rescue my kids in an emergency. I want to be able to carry my kids on my back. Like we, um, we have some jujitsu classes in the Saturday where the parents take the kids. I take my four year old kid and there's an exercise there that we have to crawl with the kids on their back. The amount of parents, they fall in the middle of the way because they're out of shape. That's embarrassing. To be honest, that's disgusting. Like if, you, if your kid sees you that out of shape, that's a bad example. So yes, you wanna exercise. And exercise is actually not just good for aesthetics. It's not just looking great. When you exercise, you produce a, a few hormones in your body. You accelerate the production of some of those hormones. And believe it or not, some of them are incredibly useful for your brain. Look back at the Ikigai concept that I love so much. Ikigai is not just about finding the areas of your life that you, you're good at, that you paid well. 
but it's also about, practice, uh, about practicing balance. Most of the people in the Japanese area in Okinawa where they research the Ikigai first, they walk to work, they cycle to work. That's exercise, physical exercise. That produces um, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine. So all of those are important. And all of those are important to help you think clearly, focus. Now, the practical, practical side of this. Um, let's just assume you work with numbers. You're in the office and you can't concentrate. Okay, maybe you're hungry and then you're saying, you're saying to yourself, I need sugar, I need chocolate, or I, I, I need a coffee. Instead of having a drink of coffee, which is good, caffeine is good in a good dosage. But instead of doing that, I'm going to challenge you. Get on the floor and do 50 push-ups. <laughs> 50 push-ups. Now, I know the average 40-year-old man can't do 20 push-ups. You know, that's a shame. Hmm. We don't have time for that, but look. If I get on the floor, and this is not your brag, right? Everybody should be able to do this. Everybody should be able to do this. I'm not trying to brag or anything. But if you're 40 years old, you should be able to do this at least 20 times in a row. At least. You go down, back, and jump. You go down, come back, and jump. At least 20 times in a row. I'm not gonna do 20. Yeah? Come on now, dog. If you can't do 20 of those, you're in trouble. So let's start next time you're having trouble concentrating. I want you to do 50 push-ups in a row, or 20 of those, what do you call it? Burpees, burpees. That'll make you burp all of the lunch that you had for sure. <laughs> but do that. If you can't do that, you're in trouble. But once you finish doing that, I can guarantee you, you sit back on your table, or you sit back on your desk, you, you will clean your sweat out, and then you will be sharply focused. Why? Because there's a download of a lot of hormones that will help you think clearly. The next one is about stress. We are so stressed these days. Everything's stress, you know? And I was just talking about hormones. There is, there is one hormone that is produced on the front lobe of your brain called cortisol. Now, people who are dealing with depression and things like that, they take cortisol because they need to be alert. They need to be in trouble. They need to put yourself in a trouble situation so you can get out of it, which is, Tricky, I don't understand how that works. But too much cortisol, too much stress, too many bills to pay, too many hours to work, too many places to be at the same time, that is actually bad for you. That will literally lock your brain. You'll go like, Rrr! and that's why people are burning out and, and having all of those crises. So how do you control your stress? Tip number one, write this down, this is good. How do you control your stress? Learn to say no. Don't you say no? I need you to do this. No. Okay. Like I, I, I shared with my wife recently, there's one thing I will never respond against you. One thing I'll never respond against you. Unless it's a life and death situation, I'll never respond to you right now. I need you to do this right now. No, I can't do it right now. Because right now is out of my Eisenhower diagram, you know? And right now will interrupt the plans that God has planned for me. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I plan my day. And if you come with a right now request, you're interrupting my day. So no, thank you, but no. Your boss comes to you, I need you to do this right now. No, you don't. You pay me to do a job, I'm gonna finish my job, and you're gonna be pleased at the end because that's what you pay me for, but I'm not doing it right now. I'll be fired, find another job. How? If you are constantly being hit by right now requests, you're not working at a job, you're being enslaved. You don't want that. So, that's the tip. Learn to say no. Second, learn to meditate. Some people are scared of meditation. Yeah, meditation is so good. Mm. Guided meditation, you know, there's, um, there's a few apps these days that you can use. Headspace is one of them. Calm is another one of them. Balance is another one of them. They all have a whole year of free subscription so you can learn how to meditate. But here's the trick. Like, they, they gonna hate me for this, but I'll teach you Guided meditation right now. Are you ready? So you sit down comfortably and you ground yourself. Just put your feet on the ground and then you just do this. You take a deep breath and exhale. We just go with simple breathing exercises, which is part of meditation. In, inhale, exhale. You do the three or four times. Once you do that, you're gonna, this is what guided meditation is. You're gonna imagine the blood flow in your body going from your feet to your head and from your head back to your feet. If you breathe in 
and you listen to your body, just listen to, you can listen to your heartbeats. And you can feel, if you focus and you go like, where's my blood now, blood in my feet. And you can feel it. And you can feel the blood coming up on the legs. That's guided meditation. The only reason why they're doing that, there's nothing magic about the blood or nothing magic about the movement. It's just helping you focus. Because meditation is not about emptying your head. It's not about emptying your mind. That's a Bruce Lee kind of thing. <laughs> it's not emptying your mind. Meditation is organizing your thoughts. And in order to organize your thoughts, you work like a traffic, traffic police officer. You just, something urgent comes, the right nows, you just let it go. Direct it somewhere, put it in another box. And then you just focus on what you're doing. And you know what I think? Like most Christians are afraid of meditation because they, are, they, they think it's an Eastern practice. Guess what? Christianity came from the East. Okay, Jesus wasn't born in Europe. Jesus was born in the Middle East. Bro, what are you talking about, man? You read the book of Psalms. Psalm number one, blessed is the man who meditates in the law of the Lord day and night. What's meditation? It's just going back to it in focus. So I'm not, I'm not advocating for you to start any sort of different religion. You can do whatever you want. What I'm saying is meditation is good because it helps you control your stress. You gotta be calm. Like one of the things that we learn with our jujitsu thing is how to be calm. Like you don't want to react in any situation. So you want to, you want to remain cool. And it's amazing. Like a few classes that you practice, how you can remain cool when someone is trying to choke you and strangle you. And you're just cool. You're just like on the details, just, just getting the grip. And just like yesterday, for example, we were, ah, never mind. I won't tell you the story, but it, it was fun. Anyway, it was fun. Next one is habits of good relationships. Toxic friends. What do I do with toxic people? Get rid of them. You're not going to save them. This is, this is a reality, right? There are people who are paid to save toxic people. They're called psychologists. So you direct them to a psychologist and you move on because you don't have the tools, the time, the experience and the resources to save these people. I don't think you have the facilities for that big man. If you go down the rabbit hole, I can guarantee you, you're going to be stuck right there and they're going to be out there somewhere dragging other people into the hole. Do not go there. Toxic people do not belong into your life. Oh, but I want to help them. This is how you help them. You close that relationship and direct them so they can find help. If they don't want to find help, they're going to ruin your life. So toxic relationships do not belong in a healthy lifestyle. Talking about healthy nutrients, good nutrients, find good nutrients. And if you, if you don't have, I mean, some people say, oh, I don't have the time to cook a good meal. Again, it's a lie. It's a matter of priorities. But if you're so busy and you can't cook a good meal, find supplements. Have some supplements because they will help you. Uh, they will help you process your life better. So nutrients. You, you want to, again, I'll go back to the Ikigai. One of the practices of the Ikigai, it's a colorful plate. When you eat, you need a colorful plate. You know how they measure if your food is healthy? Because in, in that region, they eat, they eat fish anyway. So they, they're already healthy with the meat choice. Uh, the rice is organic, but they, they always look at the color of the plate. If your plate is pale, like one color, you're not gonna be healthy. But if it's colorful, there's green, there's yellow, there's black, there's purple, there's all of that in the plate, it's a mess. It's healthy. So here's a good principle. If it's colorful, it's good. Man, I should preach about that. If it's colorful, it's good. I think I'm going to have trouble with the rainbow people. But anyway, we'll, we'll get to that point one day. Next habit, your oral health. Oral health and your microbiome. Oh, this is technical. This is scientific. What do I mean by that? Brush your freaking teeth. All right. So many people that we talk to. And it's, it's funny. We live in, in developed countries. And you see people with rotten teeth. If you brush your teeth for two hours today, two hours, and never brush your teeth again, you know what's gonna happen? You lose all your teeth anyway. Whoa! If you brush your teeth for two hours, never go to the dentist, you will lose your teeth anyway. The habit of brushing your teeth is not a one-off thing well done. It's two minutes every day, twice a day. Two minutes every day, twice a day. It will teach you consistency. And if you can, and, and you can, floss it. Because sometimes it would, man, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm an old parent teaching you how to brush it. But here's, here's something that you might not know. Did you know that if you get a bacteria in, in, in the root of one of your tooth, it can go to your arteries in your heart and you can have a heart attack because of a bacteria in your tooth? Did you know that? You didn't know that, you see? So you gotta brush your teeth. 
properly. You gotta take care of your oral health and as well as that, your microbiome. So every now and again, it's good to clean up. It's good to clean up. So you, um, you have prebiotics, antibiotics. Uh, you don't wanna be taking antibiotics all the time. You got probiotics. So um, I think I did a video a while ago about the antibiotics, prebiotics, and probiotics and, and how that concept actually help us. You know, what it is to produce good bacteria, what it is to prevent the production of bad bacteria. It's really cool, really cool. I'll, I'll find it, but if not, I'll record it again. Oral health, microbiomes. Second to last practice, spiritual grounding. Spiritual grounding. Now, my Christian brothers will hate me for that. Look, I'm a Christian. I profess my faith in Jesus Christ. I go to church. God, I'm a pastor, so like I'm in trouble. So <laughs> I am unashamed of the gospel, right? Like I will proclaim Jesus Christ wherever I go left and right. I don't care if you like it or not. That's my thing. That's my lane. That's what I do. But I understand if you want to go anywhere else, if you, if you want to do something else, I think you're probably going to find yourself coming back this way anyway, um, if, you, if you analyze the options. But you have to find spiritual grounding. At the end of the day, this vessel, this flesh thing this is just a vessel we are not this we are spiritual beings inside a fleshly vessel and you have to find spiritual grounding find your spiritual thing meditate upon it and then go on the journey and i know my christian brothers are going to hate me for this because i'm i'm recommending people to go on their journey but go on your journey and i'll be praying for you and if you have any questions i'll be here like i, I want to help you right but go on your journey whatever that journey is and once you find yourself in, in trouble doubt question just I'll be here and I'm sure there will be people around you too spiritual grounding is very important to find balance in life and and last but not least it's gonna sound like a broken record but here we go again you need to find purpose in life if you're just waking up with no purpose like when you wake up what's your purpose what's your purpose in life what are you gonna do with your content, with, with the conversations. Why are you having conversations? I used to be, uh, this is the last thing I'm gonna say. When I was in Brazil seven years ago, I spent seven years in Brazil starting the church. And the first year of the church, instead of holding services and preaching to people and all of that, I gave myself a, a, a new rule, the thousand coffee rules. I were, I were to have a thousand coffees over 365 days, that's an average of three coffees a day. I know it's a lot. And, and I would sit with people in the coffee shop and I would just ask them questions. So who are you, where you come from, what's your background, what do you like, what you don't like, all of that. At a point of the conversation, I would ask them, what's your purpose? Why are you alive? We're sitting here in this coffee shop and there's a limited amount of air here. What gives you the right to steal my air? It's a scarce resource. We're gonna run out of it. We're polluting the environment. So I know I have a reason for being here. I know I have a reason for being alive. I know I have a reason for being breathing. Do you? What's your purpose? If you don't have a purpose, if you wake up without a purpose in life, you are in big trouble. You're in big trouble. Your life is meaningless. Lord. You know, in the Bible, there is a book wrote, written by a guy, Solomon, and they say it's the most depressing book in the Bible. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a beautiful book if you understand the genre and if you understand why it was written. But if you don't, people will read it and go like, man, this guy is down to something. Because he's like, he's saying things like, I've observed life for years and I've seen the rich and the poor, the great and the humble, they all die. There's no meaning in life. This is just uh, meaningless. But if you reach to the end, he will come to the end and say, you know, live your life, enjoy with your wife, but you will be accountable for those things. So he comes to his senses and it, it's, it's a journey to discover that, but you need a purpose in your life. All of these things that I said, will do nothing to you if there is no purpose. If you don't want to get healthy, the purpose behind getting healthy, if it's not noble enough, it will do nothing. It, it will become vanity, you know? There's people being healthy for the sake of being healthy, being rich for the sake of being rich. It's vanity, and you gotta get rid of that. So I, I wanted to give you this, maybe a spiritual perspective of this Andrew Huberman thing. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you use some of it. You don't have to use all nine of them. Maybe you're mastering six of them and you just want to use three of them. Whatever the case may be, uh, let me know. I would, love to let, uh, I would love to be included in your journey and see what it is that you're practicing, what it is that you're not practicing. So you can put a comment down below and we can start that conversation. Other than that, don't forget to send this video to someone. I'm sure it will help someone. 
And if you've watched to this point, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Because it means a lot. And there is a link in the description of this video that you can join our mailing list so you can be um, alerted when we have new stuff coming up and new courses and all of that. Uh, all of that is done to help you find your purpose in life. All right? Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.